Well, I am so honored that Jamie Marisotis has come here to talk with us today about his new book, America Needs Talent. Uh, Jamie, I, I asked him in just a few minutes before we started here to tell me about his path to being head of the Lumina <laughs> Foundation. So I'm going to give you the unofficial, not the official oh, biography. Good, good. Uh, Jamie was an undergraduate at Bates College, where he's now a trustee. After college, he went to work for the college board, where he learned a whole lot, and then left the college board to become an independent consultant in higher education. From there, he became the executive director of this bipartisan commission that the book talks a fair amount about, the National Commission on Responsibilities for Financing Post-Secondary Education. It's the longest name in federal policy history for a federal commission. <laughs> and um, after that, he founded a uh, research and policy um, uh, uh, organization called the Institute of Higher Education Policy, and from there he became the, um, the president of the Lumina Foundation. The Lumina Foundation is one of the most important foundations in higher education today, and Jamie is one of the most important, provocative, and significant voices in higher education. We're going to get a chance to hear from him. Uh, it, this is going to be a Terry Gross type conversation. Um, I'll talk, ask Jamie questions for uh, 30 to 40 minutes, and then you'll have a chance to ask Jamie questions. So that's what we're going to do. I'm deeply concerned there's no one in the middle here. I'm wondering if that's a metaphor for, uh, for, our, <laughs> for our politics, probably. <laughs> not Berkeley's politics. If we're a metaphor for Berkeley's politics, 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 it would be all on one side of the room. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Yes. So I wanted to start with your definition of talent. Um, you, you have a very unusual definition. Most people think of talent as something you're born with, something that's innate, some very special ability. But your definition of talent is really interactive. It's social. Yeah. It represents a kind of complex of developed capacities and abilities yeah. that is socially important. And I, I wonder if you could start by talking about why you chose the word talent for the central concept of your book and why you defined it in that way. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the, the true story is, though, uh, I, I have few believers on this story. I had actually come up with the title of the book not thinking of the TV show, which, of course, everyone thinks of the TV show. <laughs> and the TV show, which I actually address in the book, because once I started writing the book and everybody said, oh, you know, the TV show, I realized that their definition of talent is precisely what I'm not trying to get at. What I'm not trying to get at is this idea that talent is about innate ability, that it is, in fact, uh, something much deeper than that. And in the book, I talk about the fact that, in, in my definition, talent really represents that combination of things, the knowledge, the skills, the abilities, the values, the interests, the personality traits that actually make up uh, a, a person who can be successful in life and in work. In other words, talent is what happens when all of those things come together, honed by education and experience and other uh, uh, strategies uh, that actually impact that individual and therefore impact our collective well-being as a society. And so um, it is this amalgam, this synergy of, of things that come together. And from my vantage point, the reason why I've chosen the word talent is that I think the word Talent is really what we should be talking about when we talk about the big things that we need to do to make America prosperous again. In other words, talent is the outcome of education, immigration, urban policy, all of the issues that I, that I get at in the book, uh, as opposed to what happens, and my public policy um, background probably shows throughout the book, what happens is we get so caught up in these processes and systems, and you can come to the conclusion that, in fact, what really matters is whether or not we have an immigration policy, rather than whether or not immigration policy improves our collective well-being as a country and makes the lives better for the, whether you are undocumented or here legally. Uh, you know, so the, this idea that, um, that uh, talent is something that you're not born with, uh, but that in fact is something where you can cultivate um, whatever, and I'm, I'm not an expert in innate ability, but whatever innate ability someone might have, but actually cultivate that and, and uh, aim it towards something that improves their well-being 
and therefore our collective success. That's really what I'm getting at when I talk about talent. Uh, I get, that's really wonderful. It's a really revolutionary definition, not so much as a word kind of thing, but really as a different social concept. It's not, oh, you were born with talent or you weren't born with talent. Yeah. It's that we have a collective responsibility as well as an individual one to nurture, to grow um, the, uh, the, 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 the capacities that people have in order to increase our collective wealth in a human sense, That's not right. so much That's in a monetary exactly right. sense. So I want to turn to your critique of higher education. And I'm going to quote um, a the sentence. Good stuff. Yeah, our <laughs> higher education system is dysfunctional, costly, largely unaccountable for its actual purpose. And you talk particularly about an institutional focus. Uh, you know, it's all about colleges and universities not being appropriate. Instead, you say we have to focus on the students. So what are the implications of that? Could you tease that out? Yeah. We're all sitting here at Berkeley. Yep. We have a pretty institutional focus. What, what, how, should we, how should we be thinking? If we, if we buy into what you say, how should we be thinking, those of us who work in colleges and universities, about what we should do? So uh, I think we would all agree that higher education has been a, an engine of social and economic progress for most of our history in this country. It is what's uh, made us more culturally rich, more uh, economically vibrant, uh, stronger, and more socially cohesive in, in so many ways. But it is what happens in higher education that makes all of those things possible, not the institutions themselves. And in fact, if you think about the rising demand for talent, which, which I articulate primarily in, in uh, economic ways in the book, but in a lot of ways I think are, are um, uh, um, just more difficult to describe socially, not less important. Uh, the economic and the social outcomes of, of higher education are increasingly having to do with what I was talking about in terms of talent, which is that individuals gain this great benefit from higher education, and that leads to their success and our collective well-being. And I worry about the fact that we conflate the idea that higher education is the institutions as opposed to the institutions being part of the ecosystem of higher education. So what is the ecosystem? Well, the ecosystem is the students, the learners, and what they represent. It's the faculty. It's the people who are actually associated with, with the, the, uh, the system, including employers, policymakers, uh, nonprofit organizations that might have an interest in these issues, as well as these institutions themselves, you know, these social structures that we call colleges and universities. But my fear is that we have spent so much time talking about the institutions, we've forgotten who's at the core. And who's at the core is the students and what they are there for and what they represent. Now, I don't in any way mean to suggest that the knowledge production function of higher education isn't important. It's hugely important. And it's one of the reasons why having great institutions like Berkeley is important because you've got to develop new knowledge. But here I'm mostly talking about the issue of knowledge transmission and ultimately the issues related to, to, to what really happens in terms of getting to that higher level of talent that we're talking about. So I just want to be clear here that uh, the, the institutions do serve a very important role in, in that sense. But they are part of that ecosystem. And I worry that this uh, excessive institutional focus is one of the reasons why we've gone very deeply down this path of things like rankings and the fact that we spend a lot of time using input measures and using things that are, in fact, not about what makes a place like Berkeley great, uh, but in fact, um, talking about all of these indirect measures, all of these things that ultimately have to do with reputation, that have to do with, with resources and other things, as opposed to the intellectual capital, the human talent, that's actually the net result of what happens in the knowledge production and in the, in the knowledge transmission functions of the university. And so, uh, you know, I, I've, I've tried to make this analogy. It doesn't go over well in some audiences, but I've tried to make this analogy to the fact that we spend so much time trying to associate quality, which we don't know a whole lot about in higher education because we do not have very effective common measures of understanding what quality means. Quality right now is essentially defined largely by credit hours, which are time-based units and augmented by the decision-making within an individual institution as opposed to a broader understanding of, you know, your bachelor's degree represents certain types of knowledge skills, abilities, values, interests, personality traits, like I said, we don't have that common understanding of what degrees mean, so we default to issues of the institution. So instead of saying, 
you know, does, does uh, you know, Professor Miller actually, um, is he, you know, does he, does he know certain things? What does he know? What, how can we actually tell that he knows things? We say, well, he teaches at Berkeley. And he said, well, okay, but so tell me what he knows. Well, in some ways, we have some, some measures to actually articulate that, but this association between the institution and what you actually uh, know and are able to do seems to me to be a pretty perilous, particularly in an environment where we need to meet that rising demand for talent in the country. We are way short of where we need to be. It's why there's such a, a huge wage gap in terms of, of people with college degrees compared to those who are not. The growing wage gap is uh, an, an indicator economically that in fact the labor market is has paying a premium for the people with uh, with college degrees, and that suggests that we have a real a real supply problem. So, you know, from 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 my vantage point, I think that um, this idea that um, you went to Berkeley and therefore you got a good education is no different than saying you went to the Cleveland Clinic and therefore you're healthy. It doesn't make sense to me. We, we have objective indicators that we can use in fields like healthcare or anything else where we can say, yeah, that person is healthy. We, we have some ways of understanding whether or not that person is healthy. We don't really have that in a common, under, in a common way in higher education. We have it within individual institutions. We set our own standards within institutions. Accreditors play sort of a role, but not, not much of one, if you believe the public policy debate. And so we're left with this environment where, in fact, we don't really know what the, what the degrees represent at a time when, in fact, we really need to better understand that because the country needs it. The country needs us, needs that ecosystem of higher education to produce the talent that, that it needs. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, you argue that all learning should count, um, that there should be a way of assessing prior learning experience. But one of the things that's puzzled me about that argument for a long time is when you begin, when you teach a class, you have students that are all different levels when you start that class. And certainly when I was a teacher, um, what I wanted was to enable every student to grow beyond the point that he or she was. And if you say all learning should count, and there's, and there's some sort of competency-based system for assigning um, credits, for want of a, a better word, how do you make sure that every student, wherever she is, grows? Yeah, I think, well, I think it's a very valuable point. I, I, I think uh, the fact that we want every student to grow, I think, is really important. But I think we need to recognize that their individual growth has to get them to a certain level where they are qualified to do certain things in their life and in their work. And so it's not, not unrelated to the arguments that we've had in higher education about the difference between equity and equality. Right, equality in the definition is essentially providing this, the the common base, the common platform, and then different people can stand on that platform and get to different levels. Equity is about making sure that everyone can get to a higher level, uh, and assure that they're all achieving at this higher level, so that they all can benefit equally from whatever that intervention is. And I'm a supporter of equity. I, I, I recognize the value of, of equality, but ultimately equity is what society needs because it's not good enough to get from um, level one to level three when society's gonna reward you most at four or five. You wanna make sure that you get everybody to four or five. That, that's the whole idea here. And uh, so I think from, from my, um, from my uh, perch here in a, a philanthropic organization, what we, we've tried to figure out is what is it that, that you can actually do to create this, uh, this higher level of knowledge, abilities, uh, uh, you know, uh, skills, et cetera, that, that we need. And it means that we've got to raise everyone up to a higher level. And obviously, some people are going to rise above whatever that level is there. But uh, getting them up, but not far enough to actually benefit in terms of, of what the labor market needs and what they need in terms of their democracy, I think is, is uh, uh, really valuable. They, the, uh, again, the economic indicators are so much easier to default to than the social indicators. And so I've spent most of my career arguing against the economic indicators. And in the book, I use all these economic indicators because why it's, you know, you use the data that you have. So let me mention a, another uh, 
one to sort of illustrate this point. So Georgetown Center of Education and the Workforce did a report last month that looked at the issue of, of what's happened to jobs since, 2000, since the recession ended in late 2010. And what they found was that of the 6.6 .6 million jobs that have been created since the recession ended in 2010, they described about 2.9 million of those 6.6 .6 million being what they called good jobs. Now, the definitive, uh, definition of good job, which you can argue with, is that it pays median wage or above, and it has health care or retirement or both as benefits to allow you to, to prosper in your life. Based on that definition, 2.9 million of the 6.6 .6 million were, were good jobs that were created since, since the end of 2010. Of those 2.9 million, 2.8 million required a college degree. So, you know, we, we have clear evidence here that, in fact, this demand is very high for the kinds of stuff we're producing, but we're obviously not producing enough of it because that wage differential is increasing, that, you know, employers are, are pretty dissatisfied with the amount and often the quality of what they're getting, and so we, we've, we've got to tackle this. This is about literally doing more and better than what we're doing now. If you were um, the chancellor at Berkeley, or if you were the president it seems of the highly University unlikely, of California, but go on. Um, what, what would be the consequences of what you just said? What would you do to move a place like this closer to your sense of what needs to be done? Yeah, I think we'd want to have uh, conversations about uh, two things. One is, so what does it mean to have a, a degree from Berkeley, and mm. how does that relate to what it means to have a degree from any other institution mm -hmm. that is uh, educating the kinds of students, at least, uh, that Berkeley is, is educating? I, I think that's a good starting place for that, for that conversation. What mm. would it actually mean, and how could we tell? How, would we actually have some sort of, of way of understanding whether or not we are getting there? And, you know, uh, some of the people in the room know that uh, Lumina Foundation has tried to contribute to this conversation in different ways. It's hard, it's messy. You get into issues about institutional autonomy, which I really understand, et cetera. We're certainly not trying to create a sort of lowest common denominator approach mm -hmm. here. What we're trying to do is raise the bar and find ways for institutions to have conversations within uh, the, the academy itself and then across institutions in ways that have validity that have value. It's a, it's a very complex enterprise, and it's a very complex enterprise to change, as you know from your mm -hmm. experience uh, being a president. But I think that we've, we've got to get serious about this conversation. And back to your, to your prior question, you know, I think part of what is a, a risk for higher education is the increasing uh, dissatisfaction of employers and the fact mm -hmm. that the dissatisfaction of employers is making consumers more dissatisfied, Affordability is becoming a serious concern for mm -hmm. for the for the general public. Uh, there are concerns about about uh, the production function, et cetera, and uh, we are no longer in the uh, vaunted perch that we were yeah, in society a decade or two ago. There's a lot of skepticism about what we're doing and whether or not it has value. And uh, you know, I. I say in the book, my intent here is not to murder higher education. It is to modernize it. It is very important that we not throw the baby out with the bathwater here. This, this enterprise that we call higher education today is too important to our well-being. On the other hand, you're starting to see movement, particularly in labor markets, that suggests that employers are willing to reward people even if they don't have a college degree, if they can demonstrate that they can do certain things that they as an employer can validate. So, you know, we should pay attention to what Google said. I don't think this is going to be a one-off uh, of an employer saying we no longer require a college degree as a prerequisite. Why is that? Well, from their vantage point, because it wasn't good enough to meet their entry criteria. Whether or not I agree with them, that, that's not the point. The point is that that was their, that was their conclusion for that company. And uh, I don't want to see that become a herd mentality in terms of what employers uh, do and how they, how they see, um, uh, how they see the, the talent that's being produced. But I think it's incumbent upon us to be clearer about the learning that's represented with, with, with the degrees that we produce and how we can actually demonstrate that that is real and relevant and matters to, again, to them individually and to us collectively. So I want to read a sentence from your book that's relevant to what you just said. You, you say, 
in the ideal scenario then, in this new system, every student will know where he or she is going, how much it will cost to get there, how much time it will take, and what to expect at journey's end, both in terms of learning outcomes and career prospects. I am exceedingly optimistic, aren't I? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, <laughs> idealistic. I, what, when I read that yes. sentence, I kept wondering about the mess and muddle yeah. of kids between 18 and 22. Yeah. And when students used to, you know, you, you know, when I talked to the new students at Smith, I would always say, most of you are probably undecided about your major. Yeah. And undecided is a great thing to be. Yeah. How do you accommodate what is a period of self-discovery, of experimentation, of trying to figure things out with a sense of very definitive promises and outcomes? Yeah, I, I think that um, in that, uh, one sentence, you should not be reading that. I'm suggesting that we should uh, destroy the opportunity for exploration that I think mm -hmm. is really important in, in the collegiate experience. I simply think that we need to do a much better job of explaining what we are doing, um, how we can tell that what we're, we're doing matters, and tell the students what to expect in terms of their learning experience. I, don't, I do not think that it, that is an unreasonable uh, expectation uh, uh, of the sector, and you know we have to confront some of the the, the realities of what uh, people are saying about higher education, and figure out how we can at least meet them halfway, come come their way. So if you look at what the public says about higher education today, what's the most important reason to go to college? By far, the majority of people say to get a good job. It is the number one reason by far. Now, I would argue that the idea of having a good job and a good life are equally important, that you should not try to say one is more important than the other. Higher education, for most of its history, has said we don't prepare people for jobs, we prepare people for life. We gotta find a way to meet in the middle there and figure out how to actually articulate those two in different ways. Because from my vantage point, we are not hearing what the public is saying. If we say, you know what, that job stuff, that, that uh, tell me where I'm going and what I need to, to know and all that isn't important. I think that is, uh, that is bordering on tone deaf. And I, again, I think it is a risk to higher education because you've now got these alternative opportunities for learning that are springing up. And if those things take root, I worry about undermining mm -hmm. American higher education yeah. and the tremendous benefit that we all get from higher education today and that we will need tomorrow. Yeah, but we live in a work world now where um, young men and women can expect not just to have five or six different jobs, but five or six different careers. Right. And I, I would make the argument that a broadly based liberal arts education is what best prepares someone for the kind of flexibility of um, intelligence and imagination that will be required to re educate themselves repeatedly in the course of their careers. Yeah. Is there a danger in being too um, focused on what, on specific skills that employers may want? Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I think, I think there is a real danger if in fact we see that uh, all that we care about is the outcomes that they need. Because the outcomes that they are gonna tell you they need are gonna tend to be short term mm -hmm. as opposed to meeting those, those long term needs. On the other hand, a lot of what the employers say, and this is the point where I think there is some potential for a meeting of the minds here, if we can figure out how to have the, the, the translational discussion, is that what the employers say repeatedly that they value most in their employees is critical thinking, problem solving, <laughs> communicating, uh, all of those things. And it is what we say we do best in higher education. Mm -hmm. So trying to figure out why they say that's what they need and we say that's what we produce, but they say, no, that's not what we're getting. We've got to figure out how to meet them on that and find a better way to at least uh, come their way somehow without destroying what I think is all of the things that you're underscoring, which I think are important, which is the ability for self-exploration, the ability to change your mind, the ability to actually find uh, opportunities to pursue different different career paths. And you're right that um, the way labor markets work now, the way uh, work works for individual, forget about the labor markets, is that people no longer work within industry or within job classification anymore. That, that is uh, you know pretty much gone. Uh, the typical person uh, over the course of their work life is gonna work across different industries, across many different job classifications. And it underscores the value of all of those core or generalizable things 
like critical thinking and problem solving mm -hmm. that are so important. So it's really a plea to uh, find a different way to have this conversation. And all of those things that I say in that idealized sentence are things that we uh, hopefully can get to at some point. I'm, I'm, I'm a realist. I'm not sure that we're going to be there anytime soon. Uh -huh. But I think it's worth articulating what would be, uh, what would be um, uh, possible if, uh, if we could actually have a different kind of conversation. Yeah, I wanted to ask you some questions about finance and higher education, which I know is a, is a very important concern of yours and of the foundations. You say in your book you want to reform Pell. Mm -hmm. how, how do you think Pell needs reforming? So uh, a couple of things. One is, I you know, say, first of all, I was a Pell Grant recipient. Uh, I was mm -hmm. a first-generation college student. Um, a walking advertisement for every financial mm -hmm. aid program you can probably think of. My freshman year, I got a Pell Grant. I did work study. I got a Perkins loan, a, uh, uh, what did they used to call them, George? Guaranteed student loan, now Stafford loans. Uh -huh. um, I got a scholarship for my church, a scholarship for my community-based organization. I, you know, so I, I uh -huh. represent uh, the system, uh, if there ever was one. I worked another job beyond my work-study job. Um, the Pell Grant program, which I think is one of the most important programs that we have uh, at the federal uh, level, um, has done a good job at providing opportunity and access, but my concern is that it hasn't had enough of its eye on whether or not the students who are getting <coughs> access are actually uh, succeeding. Uh, I don't have the right solution here, mm -hmm. by the way, about how you actually do this. I've been involved in these conversations for a long time. There are different mechanisms for doing this, um, and I'm not sure which of them uh, really work. My point is that entry should not be, it should be a necessary but not sufficient criteria uh -huh. uh, in terms of our understanding of what Pell Grants should do. We should be thinking about how Pell Grants can actually incentivize success for the students so that more of them uh, persist and more of them actually complete in mm -hmm. their courses of, of study. And um, you know, thinking about Pell Grants in the context of a, of a broader system uh, where we can actually uh, reduce uh, debt uh, particularly the excessive levels of debt that we uh -huh. have for that cadre of student that our public policy dialogue is very focused on right now, I think is going to be very important. And I think focusing on the success for students mm -hmm. is going to be hugely important in terms of the, the Pell Grant program. Oh, great, thanks. One of the things you recommend is STEP, Students Total Education Package yeah. that the Bipartisan Commission yeah. recommended um, back in the 90s. Um, 